Well, I've spoken here before, but it was, it was, uh, it was a long one me. I'd like to welcome you to Current Medical Concepts. This afternoon, our speaker is Dr. William Roberts. Dr. Roberts is the director of Baylor Cardiovascular Institute and Baylor University Medical Center in Dallas, Texas. He is the Dean for the Department of Continuing Medical Education, which is near and dear to my heart, and the Editor-in-Chief of the American Journal of Cardiology at the Baylor University Medical Center of Proceedings. Would you please help me welcome Dr. William Roberts. Well, thank you uh, very much, Ms. Cook. It's a pleasure of being here. I was here before, about 10 years ago, I believe, and uh, I was enormously impressed with the uh, with the beauty of your physical plant here, and I'm even more impressed uh, on this occasion. Uh, you're in an, an enviable position. Uh, thank you very much for, for having me back. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is, uh, is cholesterol, uh, how to prevent heart disease if we have it, uh, what to do about it, now, how do we get this thing going here? To, yeah, okay. Okay, sorry about that. Everybody know what this is? Yeah, this is a coronary artery. And as you know, the coronary arteries are the ones responsible for getting our heart muscle of the blood we need. And this one is terribly narrow. Uh, here the lumen is, uh, is just this little thing left. And if you look at that person next to you, one of you is going to die because of having arteries uh, such as this. Now, I hope you enjoy that cheese over that chicken and, and uh, that good salad dressing because this is what happens to it. Now, I'm not pure myself. I, I ate the same thing uh, uh, you did. But this is the major problem we have in the Western world. That is a disease which has the potential to kill or does kill. Uh, what I'd like to do in this presentation is to try to answer these six questions. Question one is, is how much atherosclerosis is needed in the coronary arteries to cause myocardial ischemia? In other words, how bad is the process before before we have trouble from it. Now, if we look at coronary angiograms, you, you get one answer. If you look at intravascular ultrasonic imaging, you get another answer. If you look at the autopsy table, which I know something about, uh, this is an answer you get at the autopsy table. Now, this happens to be in patients with acute myocardial infarction. And, it, and these were first infarct patients. Obviously, part of the heart muscle was uh, dead. Uh, we, we, took these major coronary arteries off the heart, intact, divided them into little bitty five millimeter segments, and then asked what percent of narrowing was present in each five millimeter segment. And it turned out that about a third of the lengths of the coronary artery tree was narrowed over 75% in cross-sectional area. That is, if you take a circle, divide it into four quadrants, about three of them, a little over, are obliterated. Now, the amount of narrowing, which is less than 75%, shown here, 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 really does not make any difference from a functional standpoint. So this is the important area here. Now, what this says is this, that if you take the average patient who has an acute myocardial infarction and dies, if you stretch out these three arteries, it, it's about that long. And what this says is, is about nine or a third, nine of those 27 centimeters are severely narrowed in that patient with fatal acute myocardial infarction. The same answer is in patients who die suddenly outside the heart spill. The same answer in patients who have a have myocardial infarction and it heals and they're left with chronic congestive heart failure. About a third of the length of the arteries are severely narrowed. Now you might say, well, uh, I don't deal with patients who are no longer moving and talking. 
These patients that walk in into my office, uh, certainly they don't have this degree of narrowing as in the patients with fatal coronary disease. Folks, I hate to tell you, but I'm afraid that the amount of narrowing in patients with fatal coronary disease and symptomatic myocardial ischemia is roughly the same. Does everybody understand that? That's a very important principle. When you have symptoms of myocardial ischemia, you're going to have about to as much narrowing as you're going to have when you die from it. In other words, we don't get in trouble till we have an awful lot of it. Now, this is a uh, coronary endarterectomy specimen. We have a surgeon where I am at Baylor University Medical Center in Dallas, Texas, who uh, does an endarterectomy in the right coronary artery about every time he puts a conduit in the right coronary artery. And this is the inside of that right coronary artery here, and then it continues here, and these are posterior descending. And what you see there is that this is atherosclerotic plaque everywhere. There's not a five millimeter section that's devoid of a plaque. Now, we can take the insides of these arteries and make sections like this, just like we do at the autopsy table, and guess what we find? We find the same amount of narrowing in the right coronary artery in patients who are having a bypass operation and are alive as in patients who have fatal coronary disease in the right coronary artery. So folks, if we're going to make a big dent in coronary disease, we're not going to make it after the person has the first evidence of myocardial ischemia. Now we can help some, there's just no doubt about that. Angioplasty is a good procedure, bypass is a good procedure. These lipid lowering drugs I think are magical drugs and I'll come back to that. But if we're going to make the biggest dent We've got to make it before that first symptom of myocardial ischemia occurs because at that point, there's a lot of atherosclerotic plaque present. Question two, what do these atherosclerotic plaques consist of? Now, I'm not talking about the plaques in a 10-year-old child, 20-year-old young man or woman. I'm talking about these plaques in the 60-year-old man with fatal coronary disease or symptomatic myocardial ischemia. And incidentally, the average age of death in men from coronary disease is what? Anybody? Men. Fatal coronary disease. What's the average age of death? 53. Anybody else? 60. Six, zero. 60. Average age of death, that means that half of the men with coronary disease never reach age 60. I consider 60 a pretty young person. I know I'm aware that most of you in this room don't. Average age of death in women is, is about 70, about 10 years different. So coronary disease affects relatively young people. Uh, sudden death is primarily a problem of young men. Okay, what do these atherosclerotic plaques consist of in people with fatal or symptomatic myocardial ischemia? Let me ask you more specifically. What is the dominant component of these plaques? Anybody, the dominant component? Cholesterol. Cholesterol. Anybody else? This is our most common disease, folks. One half of us in this room is going to die from it. Just look at that person next to you. I know it's that person, not you. One half of us. What do these plaques consist of? The dominant component. You say cholesterol. Anybody else? What? What? Lipid. Lipid? Cholesterol? Anything else? Going, going? Okay, here we go. The answer to the question is what's the dominant component of these plaques? Uh, these are little plaques that cause luminal narrowing 25% or less. These are plaques that totally occluded the lumen or nearly so. What's the answer to the question? Fibrous tissue, scar tissue, by far and away the dominant component of these plaques. Uh, whether the plaques are small or whether the plaques are huge. Now cholesterol and lipids um, pultaceous debris represents extracellular lipid, that's shown in green. Uh, the uh, foam cells, the intracellular lipid, relatively few of them. Now these are all patients over 40 years of age. 
If you take patients over, under 40 with symptomatic myocardial ischemia, the amount of lipid is greater. Now, how, how does cholesterol turn into this fibrous tissue? How does lipid turn into this fibrous tissue? That's a whole nother discussion. But I, in, a, in a way, I think the cholesterol turns on this clotting process, which is occurring in us all the time. So the dominant component of these plaques is fibrous tissue. Question three, how many direct atherosclerotic risk factors exist? Now the key word there is direct. What I mean by that is what risk factor or factors do you have to have in order to have atherosclerosis? Anybody? Do you have to be a cigarette smoker to have atherosclerosis? No, so it's not a direct factor. Do you have to be a diabetic to have atherosclerosis? No, so it's not a direct atherosclerotic risk factor. Do you have to have high blood pressure to have atherosclerosis? No, so it's not a direct atherosclerotic risk factor. In my view, you only have to have one factor, and that's a total cholesterol greater than 150 or an LDL cholesterol, the bad one, greater than 100. Now, you might smile, smile and snicker a bit and say, well, everybody who walks in, into my office has a total cholesterol greater than 150 or an LDL greater than 100. And I would suggest that everybody who walks into your office is a candidate for atherosclerosis. Now, when we are born, it's my understanding that umbilical blood has a total cholesterol of about 75 milligrams per deciliter. Within two weeks of life, it shoots up to about 150, and then it stays about 150 until we graduate from high school. And then it gradually, at least in the Western world, uh, goes up from there. Now the major reason the, the total cholesterol goes up after 20 is because the LDL goes up. Uh, the HDL stays about the same most of our lives. Now, this is a magical number. If you don't remember anything else my presentation today, remember 150. Why? Because if we get our total cholesterols, uh, in a, about the 150 range or below, and our LDL are less than 100, uh, the, the evidence is pretty doggone good that we will not form an atherosclerotic plaque. Now that's a pretty important statement. So I believe we've reached the stage of not just decreasing the risk of atherosclerosis, but actually preventing the process. And indeed, if one has a heart attack, if one can get that cholesterol level so that the total is about 150 and the LDL is under 100, the evidence is pretty good, it's very good in my view, that new plaques will not form. That's the best information going in cardiovascular disease today in my view. Now this does not mean that these things are not important. Now, if, you have, uh, if your blood pressure is elevated, you ought to do something about it because stroke is, is directly proportional to blood pressure. Uh, in this nation, we have 60 million Americans with blood pressure greater than 140 over 90. 60 million. I've got one of those ambulatory blood pressure things that I keep at home. And boy, I'll tell you, if your blood pressure is over, over that, you need to do something about it. Uh, you can't be healthy and smoke cigarettes. So these things multiply if the total cholesterol is greater than 150. But in my view, there's only one absolute direct atherosclerotic risk factor, and that's, a, that's an elevated cholesterol level. Now, if you look at this cholesterol business on a worldwide basis, the average cholesterol in most parts of the world is about 150. Now, here we are in the USA over here. Uh, our average uh, uh, cholesterol now in adults, uh, age 20 to 75, is about is about uh, 211. Uh, so we're we're abnormal over here, but the rest of the world is not eating what we're eating, folks. So we're the abnormal ones, not the rest of the world. Actually, in the USA, uh, this uh, slide shows the percent of our population with total cholesterol is greater than 240. Now, 240 is a very high number. 15 years ago, 240 was thought to be the upper limit of normal. In 1972, the upper limit of normal was thought to be about 300. 
That's when I was at NIH. Uh, the, the lipid guru of the world said, he didn't have, hey, you worry about patients unless their total cholesterol was greater than 300. So we've made enormous strides in the last 20 years. But look at this. And men, uh, men have, higher, have a higher percent of these high levels earlier in life than do women. But look at this, ladies. After menopause, nearly 40% uh, of women in the United States of America have total cholesterol levels greater than 240. Ladies, you have one in two chances of dying from cardiovascular disease. You have one in eight chances of dying from cancer of the breast. So this, what I'm saying, is not just applicable to the men uh, in the audience. It is, it, it is equally applicable uh, to you. Now this is a slide that breaks down total cholesterol. As you know, total cholesterol equal the LDL cholesterol, which is the bad one. I think of the L meaning lousy. That's lousy cholesterol. The HDL, uh, this is the good one as we all know. I think of the H as healthy. And as mentioned earlier, the reason our total goes up after age 20 is because the LDL goes up. And it goes up more rapidly in men and then after menopause, it's higher in women. It may be that it's higher in women here because the men with the higher levels earlier in life are no longer available here to be studied. Now, HDL, HDL estrogen stays about the same in most of us all of our lives. Uh, question four, what factors indicate that cholesterol causes atherosclerosis. If I go to a cocktail party reception and somebody says, that's a doctor over there, and somebody says, well, doctor, what causes hardening of the arteries? I don't say this is a multifactorial disease. I say it's a cholesterol problem. The evidence, in my view, is absolutely overwhelming. And here it is, right here. I think it would hold up in any court, in any land. I'm not going to go through all these things because if you don't know this, you haven't been reading the newspapers, haven't been reading the magazines, and certainly haven't been reading uh, uh, professional journals uh, in the last uh, 20 years. Interestingly, this cholesterol thing started in 1908 by some Russian physiologists who fed certain animals. Now, which ones did they choose? Anybody? What? Mice? Monkeys? Yeah, they chose rabbits. Uh, and you can only produce, this is the major principle, people, you can only produce atherosclerosis in an herbivore. You can give your dog or cat all the cholesterol you want, all the saturated fat you want, and you cannot produce an atherosclerotic plaque. But if you give these rabbits, and what they did, they took raw red meat, and then they took fat, and then they took pure egg yolks, which is essentially cholesterol, and poured it into these rabbits, and they produced atherosclerotic plaques similar to those in humans. Now, if you take a human being and put them down here and for years just pour cholesterol in them and pour saturated fat in them, can you produce an atherosclerotic plaque? Sure. So, what did you have for lunch today? Chicken. Now, are you a carnivore? Are there any carnivores in this room? Yeah. There are? We all are. You are? Yeah. You mean you think you are, you hope you are, because you eat other animals' flesh. But in actuality, folks, we're not. We're herbivores, and I'm absolutely convinced if we're going to change our health in the big picture, we got to be more like the rabbits, or we're going to have a problem. Uh, and I'm going to come back to that a little bit. Now, this is a, uh, a very important study. It's a West of Scotland study. And the thing that's important about it, it's the only primary prevention trial that we have that has used a statin drug. Now, the drug that was used in, in this particular study was a private statin. Uh, Zocor could have been used. Lipitor could have been used, but the one in this particular study was probably called Provostatin. Now these are people who had no evidence of heart disease, at least 95% of them didn't. Uh, they were treated with 40 milligrams of Provostatin every day for five years and compared to the other half of the group who were not treated with a statin drug. And in those treated with a statin drug, look what happened. A 30 to 40% reduction in these events 
in the group treated with the drug compared to the group not treated with the drug. Now, the average total cholesterol in these people was 262. 262, very, very high. Now look at this, need for angioplasty, need for bypass in the treatment group was decreased nearly 40%. Uh, nearly 40%. Coronary artery death or non-fatal infarction, about 40%. Death in coronary artery death. Paid big dividends in these people with high cholesterol levels who were treated. Now this is the, uh, uh, this is one of the secondary prevention trials, the 4S study. Uh, the 4S means that 4,444 patients were studied. The S means that it took place in the five Scandinavian countries, or you can use the S to mean simvastatin or Zopor. And these were a little over 5,000 patients. They were followed for over five years, and half of the group were treated with either 20 or 40 milligrams of simvastatin or Zocor, and the other half were not treated. You can't do these trials anymore. You can't have a control group anymore. The evidence is too overwhelming. Now, 80% of these patients have had an acute myocardial infarction, which had healed, and the other 20% had angina pectoris. And look what happened to the treatment group. Uh, anything uh, uh, to the left of this line uh, means a very significant difference compared to the placebo group. If one of these horizontal lines touches this line, it means that it's not significant. So you can see that every parameter here was highly, highly significant. Um, total mortality decreased 26%. Coronary mortality in these patient, patients who had already had a myocardial infarction decreased 42%. Now, what drug can you give a patient who's lying in that coronary care unit when you send them home that will decrease their chance of having another heart attack in five years by 42%? Beta blocker? Well, maybe 25%. Aspirin tablet? Maybe 25%. ACE inhibitor? Maybe 15%. Look at this. Statin drug, over 40% and in some studies, over 80%. Folks, if I had a heart attack and I came to your hospital with acute myocardial infarction or unstable angina or peripheral arterial disease or carotid arterial disease or abdominal aortic aneurysm, folks, if you gave me one drug, I would want to have a statin drug. And don't send me out of the hospital with symptomatic atherosclerosis without putting me on a statin drug. The evidence for this use is absolutely overwhelming. Look at this. Need for angioplasty and bypass decreased 37% in the treatment group compared to the control group. And that was in the five Scandinavian nations. And they don't do much bypass and much angioplasty over there. I'll tell you, if you took this, if this study was done at Baylor University Medical Center where I am, that reduction would have been about 60%. And people complain, well, I can't afford these drugs. Can't afford these drugs compared to a bypass operation. Uh, it's my understanding that last year, coronary artery bypass grafting cost 1% of the gross national product of this nation. 1%, not of medical expenses, but of gross national product of this nation. My son is a cardiovascular surgeon, so I'm not against surgery. But I think we, we don't need it. I tell him, I'm trying to put you out of business, buddy. And I think we now have the armamentarium to do that. This is the CARE study. Uh, the average total cholesterol in the 4S study was also 262. The average total cholesterol in this study was 207. All of these patients had also had a heart attack. And they were put on uh, provostatin, 40 milligrams a day, followed for five years compared to the control group. And look at these reductions. Stroke decreased 26%. Same with uh, the 4S study. Now, stroke is a lot worse than a heart attack. Dear God, don't let me have a stroke. Get your blood pressure down. But look, these statin drugs are good in preventing a stroke. They're good in preventing having angioplasty and bypass, even unstable angina, uh, non-fatal myocardial infarction, coronary artery death. Very useful things. Now, this slide is one of the better ones that I can show. Probably the, the one 
of two best slides that I've got. The 4S study here started with an average total cholesterol of 262. The goal of that study was to get the total cholesterols to less than 200, and they barely did that. Now, this is the coronary artery event rates in percent. The, the CARE study started about where the 4S study ended. That is, with total cholesterols averaging about 207, and they came down here to about 165. Now, the point of this slide, all of these patients had had heart attacks, either acute myocardial infarction or angina, and no matter where you start on that slide, the lower you get your cholesterol level, the greater you decrease your chances of having a subsequent heart attack. Now, if you're dealing with a patient who's having a heart attack, of course you want to get them over that first heart attack. But the next thing is preventing a second heart attack. And nothing does that better uh, than these uh, statin drugs. Nothing, nothing does it better, including angioplasty, including bypass, etc. Now this is a study which was published in February 1997, our present year. It's called the post coronary Artery Bypass Graft Trial. All of these patients had had bypass operation anywhere from 1 to 11 years earlier. And half of the group was put on lovastatin, 76 milligrams of dose, averaging. The, 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 the authors call this aggressive treatment. And the authors call this group moderate treatment, moderate. See, you can't have a placebo anymore. So these were treated with an average dose of four milligrams of lovastatin. I consider that a placebo uh, a dose, uh, but they call it a moderate. Uh, give me the numbers and, and, and somebody else can call it what they want to. But here you got four milligrams compared to 76 milligrams. These people got their LDL down into the 90s. These people were in the 130s. Uh, this was primarily an angiographic trial. They did an angiogram at baseline and then a few years later, angiographic progression in the graphs, 27% here, 39% here, new narrowings, 10% here, 21% here. It pays after a bypass operation to be on one of these statin drugs. I have no, no stocks in pharmaceutical companies, folks. Uh, I, I, I'm uninvolved from the pharmaceutical standpoint, but I do think these statin drugs are, the, uh, are magical drugs. I think they are to atherosclerosis what penicillin uh, is to infectious disease. And when penicillin came out, doctors clamored for it. Uh, the pharmaceutical industry hadn't figured out how to make, how to produce it in mass quantities. So uh, patients were dying of various infectious disease because doctors couldn't get it. Now we have these magical drugs for atherosclerosis, and what happens? They're being greatly underused. There are only 3 million Americans, as I understand it, on a statin drug. And yet we have 40 million Americans with uh, total cholesterols greater than 240, and we have an estimated 15 million Americans with symptomatic atherosclerosis, be it in the coronary system, carotid, aorta, or peripheral arteries, 15 million. And no more than about two and a half of those million are on, on a statin drug. Question five, how can symptomatic atherosclerosis be prevented? And if present, how can it be arrested? Anybody, what's the answer to that question? Diet, what's your goal? What are you trying to do? 150, that's the answer. I don't care how you get it there, but if you want to prevent plaques from forming, or if you want to prevent new plaques from forming in somebody who's already had a heart attack, you want to get that total cholesterol in the 150 arena. And you want to get the LDL less than 100. And we now have the armamentarium to do it. How can normal cholesterol levels be prevented from rising? And how can elevated levels be lowered to normal? We all know the answer to that. We've got to do three things. We've got to decrease the quantity of cholesterol we take in. We've got to decrease the quantity of saturated fats we take in. And we almost surely have to decrease the quantity of total calories we take in. Now cholesterol. Cholesterol is actually easy. All cholesterol, as we all know, comes from animals and their products. Uh, it's always uh, amused me in walking into a grocery store and go by the peanut butter counter 
and uh, one peanut butter would say, no cholesterol in this peanut butter. Of course there's no cholesterol there. It's not an animal. It's a peanut. So if we quit eating animals and their products, we don't take in any more cholesterol. Now, about half the cholesterol we take in comes from eggs and their products, and uh, the visible and non-visible eggs, and most of the rest of it comes from cows. We call that beef, but it's really bovine muscle, that's 28%, milk is 9%, cheese is 5%, and butter is 4%. So if we quit eating cows, there's a whole cost going on out there with cows, you know. It's, it's terrible. Uh, in this country, we got 265 million people, and we got 100 million cows, and we kill 100,000 of them every day. 100,000 of them, weigh 1,100 pounds. We're killing them every day, and uh, we do it differently in the USA uh, and Canada than, than in the rest of the world, as you know. We bring them into these feedlots; they last four to five months of life, and there we feed them uh, grain. And soybean 20, 25 pounds every day. And why do we do that? We do that to make them fat. We want to marble them because they taste better that way. And then we kill them and then they kill us. And that, that's the way the system works. And, and pigs, we kill about 250,000 pigs every day. Some of them never touch planet Earth during their entire existence here. And folks, if you're a chicken, don't wander into the USA. We now kill an estimated 19 million chickens every day. 19 million. Now folks, we only take in about 300, 400, or 500 milligrams of cholesterol every day. Now how do you picture that? I can tell you that a toothpick weighs 100 milligrams. So none of us take in the, more than the equivalency of three or four toothpicks of cholesterol every day. Now fat, fat is the villain. Uh, in the U.S., we average a little over 140 grams of fat consumed by adults in the USA, and I think in Texas it may be even a little higher than that. Now, the problem with fat is about a third of it is saturated. Now we're talking about grams. Let's say we take in 120 grams. That means about 40 grams of that is saturated. And when the, Now, how does saturated fat cause our cholesterol levels to go up? That's been a tough question to answer, but it looks like the way saturated fat works is that it's, it gets into that cholesterol cycle and is converted uh, into cholesterol. Now every fat has all three components. The saturated, we take in saturated fat, our cholesterols go up. We take in monounsaturated, polyunsaturated, they go down or they have a neutral effect. All of them are very high in calories. But we want to prevent eating these that are, that are mainly saturated. The predominant portion is saturated, like coconut oil, my God, 92% saturated fat. Now, there's some evidence that monounsaturated is better for us than polyunsaturated. And here we have olive oil, 77% monounsaturated. Societies that eat a lot of olive oil, Italy, Greece, uh, they have a much lower frequency of atheros symptomatic atherosclerosis than we do over here. Peanut butter even is 48% of monounsaturated. Now, if you want to get a good grease job quickly, there's no better place than the fast uh, food chain. Uh, now, somebody went around and tried to determine the ingredients of the, of the hamburgers. Uh, the champ at the moment is Carl's Jr. Double Western Bacon Cheeseburger. Folks, that's the Cornell Artery Bypass Special. Uh, you take that sucker, you got over a thousand calories in that single hamburger. And you take it, squeeze it real hard, you can come up with 14 or 15 teaspoons, not grams, but teaspoons of fat in that single hamburger. Now, none of us should eat over 1,800 milligrams of sodium. That's not salt, that's sodium alone. Per day, we'd all be better off if we limited to less than 1,000 milligrams. But you can get all that daily value in this Carl's Jr. No problem every day. <laughs> I'll have a half pound double deluxe bacon steer burger, please. You want chemotherapy with that? I, I think that's the truth. I like this statement by William Collins. He says, the carnivore animal has almost an unlimited capacity 
to handle saturated fats and cholesterol, whereas a vegetarian and herbivorous animals have a very restricted capacity to handle these food compounds. It is virtually impossible to produce atherosclerosis in the dog, even when 100 grams of cholesterol, now that's 200 times the average daily intake for humans in the USA, plus a quarter pound of butter fat are added to its meat ration. In contrast, adding only two grams of cholesterol daily to a rabbit's chow for two months produces striking fatty changes in its arterial wall. Now, are you more like the rabbit or more like the dog? Let's take a look at that. When you look at your uh, uh, appendages, do you see claws or do you see hands that we're supposed to be using for gathering these fruits and vegetables? Now, there some argue that, well, the teeth in front of our mouth are sharp, so we're really omnivores, but most of our teeth are flat for grinding. Now, the intestinal tract of a, of a human being is very long. It will almost stretch from that wall over to here. Now, the intestinal tract of a carnivore, dog or cat, is very short. You give them something to eat, they've got to go outside in a few minutes. They have a short intestinal tract. Now, when you cool your body, do you pan or do you sweat? When you drink water, you lap it like your cat or do you sip it? I don't know any human beings that make their own vitamin C. Carnivores make their own vitamin C. Of course, we have to obtain it from our diet. Folks, I think we think we're one of these and we certainly conduct our lives as if we were. But we're not. We're not. And if our health is going to improve, I'm absolutely convinced we must move more to the right. We have 21 meals a week and there's no reason why we have to have flesh in all 21 of them. I try to uh, not have flesh more than about five out of those 21. I try to skip also a, a meal uh, periodically, so I eat about 18 meals a week, so I'm down to flesh to about five of them. I think we must move to the right if our health is to improve. Oh, oh, oh sorry. Uh, there are some diseases that pure vegetarians don't get. This started in Central Africa about right after World War II. I'm not going to go into all the reasons, but look at this. Vegetarians, and I'm talk, talking about a day, a week, a month, or a year. I'm talking about decades. Hardening of arteries, atherosclerosis, very uncommon. High blood pressure, very uncommon. Certain cancers, uh, maybe breast cancer, 5% is hereditary, but 95% is not. Uh, much more common in meat eaters than non-meat eaters. Same with the colon, same with the prostate gland. Diabetes after age 50, just unheard of or almost in pure vegetarians. They're not obese, no peptic ulcer, constipation, hemorrhoids, diverticulosis, appendicitis, gallstones, kidney stones. Look at this, ladies. Osteoporosis. Can we change our health? Of course we can. we got to move more to the herbivore side. And if we don't, we're not going to change our health. Uh, now, during World War II, there were certain countries that didn't have much meat available, and not much butter, and not much cheese, and not much milk. And what happened to the cardiovascular death rate during that period of time, 1939 to 1945? Well, in Sweden, boom, cardiovascular death rate fell. In Finland, boom, it fell. In Norway, boom, it fell. In the USA, it just kept on going up. Can we change our health? Of course we can. Now, this slide has to do with cancer of the breast. Why is he talking about cancer of breast? Well, let me show you why. These, these are the grams of fat consumed by adults in these countries around the world. So here we are in USA, right up there, with a little over 140 grams of fat consumed. I can tell you that a deck of cars weighs 75 grams. So we are about 140 grams of fat. We're almost two decks of cars of fat uh, eaten by American adults every day. And we have one of the highest frequencies of cancer of the breast in the world. But I can tell you this slide could just as easily be cancer of the colon. It could just as easily be high blood pressure, and of course, it could just as easily be atherosclerosis. The lower the quantity of fat consumed by any society, the lower the frequency of our two most common cardiovascular conditions and two of our three most common cancers. Can we change our health? Of course we can. Every time we pull that chair up to that table, we are making a statement regarding our health. Now, the most commonly prescribed diet by physicians in the USA is a 30% of calories from fat. Wonderful start. But 
What reduction do you get in total cholesterol? What reduction do you get in LDL cholesterol by going from 40% of calories from fat to 30%? And the answer is taught by Hunting Hack and others in 1993. We reduce our total cholesterol by 5%. 5%. We reduce our LDL on the average 5%. And there's quite a bit of variation. So when you're looking at that one patient across from your desk, you don't know whether that person's going to be a, a diet responder or, or not. Some of them, uh, 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 the cholesterol levels actually go up. But on the average, you can't count on getting but just a 5% reduction. So don't send me out of the hospital after a heart attack with a 30% of calories from fat diet. Dear God, give me a drug that will lower my cholesterol level by 27% percent at the starting dose. And what are these drugs? Uh, these are the statin drugs, and as mentioned already, in my view, these are really uh, magical, magical drugs. Now this uh, slide here, I'm proud of this slide, it's going to come out uh, uh, next month, July 1, in the American Journal of Cardiology from the editor column. Uh, what it shows are the, the, the five presently available statin drugs. Their comparative doses, comparative efficacy, uh, the frequency of liver enzyme elevation greater than three times the upper limit of normal, what it does to HDL, what it does to LDL, and what it does to total cholesterol. Now the new player, the most powerful one right now, is a torvastatin. Five milligrams of a torvastatin, roughly, is equivalent, it may be three milligrams, but it's roughly five, that's a conservative uh, estimate. Uh, is roughly equivalent to 10 milligrams of semvastatin, 20 milligrams of lovastatin, 20 milligrams of provastatin, and 40, maybe even as much as 80 milligrams of fluvastatin. Now this is less call, and less means less. I don't see any need to use less call anymore. It just is not, is not very strong. Uh, Provastatin is provocol, lovastatin is mevacor, semvastatin is zocor, and atorvastatin is lipitor. Now, what I like to know about these drugs is what dose of which statin produces an LDL reduction of 27%, and that's what those doses are. At the same time, you get a 22% on the average reduction in total cholesterol. Now, total and LDL are dose related. So if you know what gives it a 27% reduction here, which dose, and a 22% reduction here, every time you double the dose, you increase the LDL reduction by seven, and you increase the total cholesterol reduction by five. So this is the rule of sevens, and this is the rule of five. So if we double the starting dose of a torvastatin, or the initial dose, uh, I think the initial dose is whatever it is that gets the person to go, uh, not, not, not the beginning necessarily. Uh, at any rate, a torvastatin, 10 milligrams is the lowest uh, available dose. You just can't crack that tablet into two, two fives. Uh, now at these lower doses here, uh, you get a 0.25% uh, liver enzyme elevation greater than three times the upper limit of normal. That's one out of 400 people. Every time you double the dose, you double that uh, liver enzyme elevation. Uh, but here you go from 22% to 25, the rule of five, and here you go 27 to 34%, and here you get the enzyme elevation, one out of 200 people. These are some of the safest drugs ever produced. If you double the dose again, we're now up to 32% reduction in total and 41% reduction in LDL. HDL is not dose related, so you get about a 7% increase in HDL, irrespective of the dose. Now triglycerides, these are very good triglyceride lowers too. Triglyceride lowering, uh, the percent triglyceride lowering has to do with the, the, the initial triglyceride level. So the higher triglyceride level you're starting with, the greater the reduction you get. And um, with, with the higher doses of these drugs, you can get a, 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 a up to 45% reduction in triglyceride levels. That's pretty good, and maybe even more at times. Uh, now, atorvastatin and simvastatin. Atorvastatin is, is really powerful at 
these up limits here, and you can get at least a 55% reduction in LDL, and in some studies, over a 60% reduction. Now, what does a 60% reduction in LDL mean? That, that goes from 240 to 100. I mean, that's a remarkable uh, thing. And even at these high doses, you get living enzyme elevation greater than three times the upper limit of normal, and only 2%, 2% uh, of the population study. The rule of five, the rule of seven. That's an important thing to remember. Then you can figure out very readily. Now what I like to know is converting these percent reductions into, into absolute numbers. So let's say you start out with a patient who has an LDL of 240 and you want to get that LDL down to 100. And that's what you need to prevent plaques from forming. Uh, you've got to decrease that LDL by 140 milligrams per deciliter. That's going to, you're going to need 58% reduction to do that. So you you got to be on high doses uh, to do that. High doses of atorvastatin. Uh, Simvastatin is, of course, not out yet at those high doses. The Americans made application for that, but they're not out yet. Now, let's say you're down here 160, uh, and you want to get uh, that LDL to uh, 100. That means you've got to knock 60 milligrams per deciliter off. You've got a 38% reduction that you need. So let's go back to this slide. You've got, you want a 38% reduction. So you want to start at, probably at that level, possibly at this level. Don't fool around with that level if you want to get a 38% reduction. Go for the money right from the very beginning. That's my view. Now, in my view, who should be on a statin drug? Anybody with symptomatic atherosclerosis. And I don't care whether it's carotids, coronary, aorta, or peripheral artery. These patients need to be on the drug. The reason for identifying familial hypercholesterolemia is that these people need to be on a statin drug. Uh, no matter what diet you put these familial variety of people on, you're not going to get the, you're not going to control the cholesterol levels adequately. Now, what about all these people in between? Uh, this, this is the, the tricky area now. I think we don't know for sure. I'll tell you, if I had diabetes, I'd be on a stat drug right off the bat. I'd be on an ACE inhibitor too, right off the bat. Uh, what about the 50-year-old man who's a heavy smoker, who's obese, low HDL, has high blood pressure? These are, here's a person sitting on a time bomb. Uh, I, I think these drugs need to be used more from a preventive standpoint as well as from an after an event standpoint. Now this is a wonderful study that was published in Circulation uh, in February 1997. And what this study shows is, is that these statin drugs are anti-myocardial ischemia. This was a study done at the Brigham Hospital, Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. They took, uh, they took 40 patients, all of whom by 48-hour Holter monitor had SD segment myocardial changes of myocardial ischemia. And then half the group were put on a lovastatin, uh, a relatively small, uh, 20 milligrams a day, that's the treatment group, and uh, they were compared to the placebo group, and then four to six months later, they repeated the 48-hour Holter. Now, what did they find? In the treatment group, 13 out of the 20 patients no longer had any objective evidence of myocardial ischemia, and most of the others had less frequent evidence of myocardial ischemia by Holter. In the placebo group, only two of the 20 no longer had uh, evidence of myocardial ischemia, and most of the others uh, uh, increased. Wonderful study, and there, there's another one out now showing the same thing. These are good myocardial ischemic drugs. Now these are coronary arteries in a woman uh, at sites of maximum, maximal narrowing. This woman was 103 years of age. Now the reason I show this slide is simply to point out that we don't have to have atherosclerosis just because we're getting older. This woman was 103, look at her artery. This is a left main, beautiful, I'll trade with her right now. This is a right, wide open, that's the biggest plaque in her body. Left anterior descending, beautiful. Atherosclerosis is not a degenerative disease. We are the degenerates, sir, I'm afraid. This poor woman was run over by an automobile. Uh, in 
summary, by the time coronary atherosclerotic disease is diagnosed clinically, the process is extensive and diffuse, and most of the plaque is not reversible because fibrous tissue is the dominant component. The first clinical manifestation of coronary atherosclerosis is the last in one out of four patients because the first manifestation is fatal, sudden death outside the hospital. If you wait to start treatment after a coronary event, you're starting with 75% of the patients, and then some patients with acute myocardial infarction, believe it or not, don't make it. So you're starting with maybe 68% or 70% of the patients at most. That's too late. Even though lipid-lowering therapy after an atherosclerotic event is of proven benefit, the frequency of recurrent events is high and the process is usually eventually fatal. Why? Why? You take the 4S study. What was their goal? Their goal was to get the total cholesterol just under 200. Nobody, no study has set the goal at 150. And I can tell you, I'll bet you any amount you want to bet that if these studies set the goal for 150, uh, the chances of another event would diminish tremendously, tremendously. Preventing coronary events would eliminate 90% of patients with congestive heart failure. Why? Because 90% of patients with congestive heart failure are there because of coronary atherosclerosis and 90% of cases of malignant ventricular arrhythmias because 90% of them are due to coronary atherosclerosis. The emphasis in my view needs to change from decreasing the risk of atherosclerotic events to preventing and arresting atherosclerosis and unless we're willing to be pure vegetarians, that requires more lipid-lowering drug therapy administered earlier and at higher doses. Lights off, lights on, slide off. Thank you very much. Any comments, questions?